Welcome. And today we're doing the May June 2020 paper 43 extended. Let's get going. Question one, and we start in question one A with Rashid who catches the 920 bus at Abbots. So there's Abbots there. 920 means he catches this bus, gets the 920 on the bus. Find the time the bus arrives at South Moor. South Moor is here, so the bus goes. And that's when it arrives at 10.07. Right. Now we got Anissa, who leaves home at 8.27. Okay, let's just clear this. So let's write that down. We start our journey at 8.27. It takes 25 minutes to walk to stop at Calais. So here we go. 25 minutes that will be 8.52 so she goes to Calais seems that uh, she's just missed by 5 minutes the 8.47 bus so she'll have to catch the 9.42 bus that's a long wait alright so well we were 8.52 we jump another 8 minutes now it's 9 o'clock and then she has to wait another 42 minutes till 9.42. Right, she goes next bus to center point. So there she goes, and she arrives at center point at 10.30. Right, so it means that's another 18 minutes until 10 o'clock and then another 30 minutes until 10.30 when she arrives. All we need to do now, add up those numbers. Don't waste your time. Use a calculator. And add up those minutes. So it's 25 plus 8 plus 42, plus 18, plus 30, 123 minutes it is, 2 hours and 3 minutes. Question 1c, right, we're working out speed here, remember the formula, okay, actually the formula is right here, kilometers per hour, kilometers being distance, hours being time so speed distance time so to work out the speed we want the distance we got that 29.4 and we divide that by the time in hours all right so that's the just the time it takes to get from average to center point and every journey is the same so we can use any of these I'm just going to use the first one, it seems the easiest. Okay, so from 6.50 to 8 o'clock, from 6.50 to 7, that's 10 minutes. And then from 7 to 8, that's one hour. So the time, total time. One hour, ten minutes. Is that equal to one point one hours? No, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. Okay. Remember, because hours is base sixty. We count to sixty, then we start again. So that will be one hour and ten out of sixty minutes. Okay. So that's one hour, we can simplify it, uh, one sixth of an hour. We can put that into a calculator, 29.4 divided by, oh, let's use the mixed fraction button, one hour and one out of six, or 10 out of 60. And there we go, 25.2 kilometers per hour. Okay, this is where the most mistakes crawl in 
writing hours as decimals. You can also write it, of course, what is 1 divided by 60? 1 divided by 6. Okay. It's 1 hour and 1.6 recurring hours, but to believe it in fractions, it's more accurate. And we've done it. Right, question 1D. Let's see. We have to work out lots of, things. lots of information there. Okay. We work out the total cost of tickets for the journey. We know what an adult ticket costs, but they don't tell us exactly what a child ticket costs. They only tell us is three quarters. Well, that's straightforward to work out. We do $2.80 times three quarters would tell us the price of a child ticket. $2.10. Okay, so child ticket is $2.10. All right, next we need to find out how many of each ticket there is by using the ratio. So if there's five adults buying a ticket, then there will be three tickets going towards children. That's a total of eight tickets. Okay, but we've not been selling eight tickets. We've been selling 56 tickets. Fill up the bus. All right, so we need to continue the ratio. 56 divided by 8, of course, 7. 7 times we need to sell 5 and 3. So, I mean, the total number of adult tickets is 5 times 7. 35 adult tickets is being sold. And 3 times 7, 21. Okay. Just to check in your head. 35 plus 21 is 56. That's how many tickets we're selling. That's the one we want. All right. So now straightforward, we work out the total of the prices. So 35 adult tickets at $2.80 each. Will be a total of $98. And 21 children tickets at $2.10 a ticket. Not much cheaper for children, is it? $44.10. So in total, adult tickets plus the children tickets. $142.10. And well done. Question 2A transformations. Here we go. First one says draw an image of triangle T after a reflection in the line y equals x. First thing we need to do here is the line y equals x. What does it mean? It means when y a zero x is zero so it has to go through the center if y is one x is one if y is seven x is seven if y is minus five x is minus five okay so it's a diagonal line going through zero okay not there like this missing zero going through zero so top right hand corner seven seven bottom left not quite in the corner minus five minus five Okay, there's a few little booby traps in this question, and that is one of them. Right, now when we do reflection, remember that each point of our triangle T is diagonally the same distance from the mirror line on the other side. So let's start with the nearest point there. Uh, remember, we need to travel exactly diagonally, meaning from there to there is one, two, three squares. So on the opposite side, one two, three squares, that point will be over there. Okay, the right angle, diagonally, one, two, three, four, five, six squares. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Brilliant. It is right beneath our other point, so it must be correct. And the last corner there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, six seven right over there okay if it's not right you will have a bad feeling in your stomach you will look at it and you say ah this doesn't feel right trust your instinct on this 
If it's right, it looks right. Your brain know what the reflection look like. Question 2a part 2. This time we're doing a vector. Remember, vectors, the top number tells us left or right. If it's negative, we go to the left. Bottom number tells us up or down. If it's positive, we go up. So we need to go one value to the left, three values up. Okay. Use tracing paper to help you trace the shape. Ask for tracing paper if you don't have it in the exam. I should give it to you. Right. So what do we do? We go one square to the left, three squares up. Be careful. This is another booby trap. One square only counts half a value. To go a whole value, we need to go two squares. So to go one square to the left, or one value to the left, we need to go two squares from minus four to minus five. Okay, on the x-axis. And then we need to go three values up. So from two, we need to go one, two, three values up to five. Okay, so one, two, three, jumping two squares at a time. Okay, they don't often do this, but you need to be sharp because this will catch you out. In fact, he did catch me out the first time. The new shape up there. This is one reason you need lots of sleep the night before an exam. So that little silly booby traps like this don't catch you out. Question 2a part 3. Okay, do note they say fully and they say single. Single means don't try to go for reflection rotation. Don't try to go for, you know, students do this all the time. Single means there's only one. To get full marks, you need to find that only one. And since the shape has changed size, there can only be one transformation this is, and that's an enlargement. Can't be anything else. Okay. So you write enlargement, you get your first mark. Now, what else in enlargement? We need the center of enlargement. To do that, we need to connect corresponding angles. Let's start by connecting the right angle to the right angle of the enlargement. There we go. Now let's let's connect the acute angle, the smallest angle in the triangle. That's clearly that one and that one there. We connect them. And then we got the last acute angle left. The second smallest or second biggest angle in the triangle is horizontal. If you do it right, you'll see they converge very nicely and that point there, the point zero. Three. So that's the center of enlargement. Let's write it down. Excellent. We now have two out of three marks. Next is the scale factor. So let's have a look at that. Let's look at the height of this triangle. Here it's two. There it's three. It's gotten bigger. Look at the base. Here it's 6, there is 9. What do I multiply 2 by to get 3? What do I multiply 6 by to get 9? Or the other way around. Let's divide it. What is 3 over 2 or 9 over 6? Answer being 1 and a half. 3 times 1 and a half is 3. 6 times 1 and a half is 9. Okay, scale factor is 1.5. But that's not the whole story, so hang on. Because it's not correct yet. A straightforward enlargement of one and a half would have been a enlargement over here. That would be one and a half, okay? And it would not have fitted either. It would be something like that. That would be in scale factor one and a half. The enlargement one and a half would have been on this side, the same side as the shape from the center. But because our enlargement is on the opposite side of the center of enlargement and it flipped over, this is what we call a negative enlargement. So 
Final answer here, scale factor 1.5, minus 1.5 to get full marks. Well done. Question 2B, they tell us a quadrilateral, a quadrilateral being a four-sided shape. So let's just keep this simple. Let's make it a square. Is enlarged by a scale factor of 1.2. So let's get a little bit bigger. So imagine that this square's got a side length of 10, then this one will have a side length of 12. All right, centimeters. Then it tells us this quadrilateral has got an area of 20 centimeters square. What is the area? We're going to make it x of the enlargement. So when it comes to a Enlargement scale factor, these shapes are similar, and we used to do it like this, right? We got the area of the shape you want to know divided by the area of the shape you want to. We've got that will give us a scale factor, okay? Same as then we wrote the smaller one over the bigger one, 12 divided by 10, which we know now is 1.2, okay? So we don't have to do that. All right. Now, what is very important is that this 10 and 12 centimeter is the linear scale factor, whereas the area is a different scale factor. This is centimeter squared. Okay. It's not 20 squared. Centimeter squared just shows us the units. So, meaning if we want to work this out, we need to square the linear scale factor. So, our calculation here would be x equals multiply the 20 there 20 times 1.2 squared let's do that and there we go 28.8 centimeter square is the area of the enlarged shape you got it question three a part one a so we got all these tigers living in Southern Asia and it tells find the number of tigers in Nepal. There's 198 as a percentage of the number of tigers in Bangladesh. That's 106. So do note the tigers in Nepal is more than the tigers in Bangladesh. So that means our percentage is going to be more than 100. Don't be scared of that because the one number is bigger than the other. Oh, there we go. That is 186.79, etc. Rounded to three significant figures, 187%. Question 3B, the ratio of tigers. Let's start. Okay, order is important. So first we've got Bangladesh. Bangladesh, 106 tigers. Then we got Indonesia, 371. And then we got India. I want two eyes. 2,226. Next step would be to write this in its simplest form. Okay. Now, we can't divide it by 2 because the ones in Indonesia is an odd number. Okay. What about 3? Quick way to check if something is divisible by 3 is by adding the digits together. For example, 106. If we add the 1, the 0, and the 6, we get 7. 7 is not divisible by 3, so 106 is not divisible by 3. They did not make... It's easy to simplify these numbers. The best is just to try. Okay, we can half 106 by dividing it by 53. Is 371 divisible by 53? Yes. Is 2226 divisible by 53? Yes, 42. And that is the ratio.
Question 3a part 2. The number of tigers in India has increased. That is good news. But how much has it increased? Let's see. It's 2,967. It used to be 2,226. Make sure you press the right buttons on your calculator. So that is 741 more tigers. Brilliant. So that's 741 more tigers out of the original amount, 2226. We want to work it out as a percentage, so we times it by 100. Okay, which gives us. 33.28 etc. Rounded to three significant figures 33.3. Sweet. Question 3a part 3. Right, the number of tigers is approximately 30.48% greater. So that means it increased by 30.48%. So whenever we increase by a percentage, we take the original amount, which is 100%, we add the increased amount, and then we end up with the increased amount. So it's 130.4%. 8% of the original amount because it's more, it's more than 100%. Okay, as a multiplier, we divide this by 100, so that would be 1.3048. So that means if we take the amount of tigers in the year 2010, the amount of tigers they were then. And we multiply it by the multiplied 1.3048. We would get the new amount in 2014, which is what they told us up here 2226, 2226. So we're going back in time, and because we go back in time, we do the calculation in reverse. Okay, so instead of multiplying this, we now need to divide it. So that will be 2226 divided by 1.3048 equals, okay, gives us 1,706 tigers. So this makes sense. There was 1,706 tigers. It increased by roughly 30%. Now there's 2,206. Okay. So there we go. So you're working out. Okay. It's important to show every step. You get a mark for showing this multiplier there. Right. And you get a mark for your calculation and a mark for the answer. All right, question 3b, we've got a lot of information here. What we need to do is just go step by step. Let's start with the formula they've given us. B equals A, B, X. What information do we have? All right, P is the population of the hive, X month after the start of June. Okay, what is that? In this case, is 2662. We don't know what is A and B. But we know it was 2662. Three months after the start of June, so X is 3. Now, because we have two unknowns, A and B, we need two equations to solve this. Now we know that at the beginning we had 2000 Bs and that was 
how many months after the start of June? Zero. Anything to the power of zero is one. One times a is a. We now have the value of a. Now that we have the value of a, we can substitute it into this equation, which is 2662 equals 2000 times b cubed. So the next step would be to divide the 2000 on the other side. And now is a good time to cube root. both sides to get rid of the cube. So let's work that out. So shift, that gives me the cube root. 2662 over 2000 gives me a sweet, clear answer of 1.1. Now we can use that formula again. B equals ABX. We know what A is, that's 2000. We know what B is, that's 1.1. And now we're looking at the time frame of seven months. So seven months after, so that's to the power of seven. Let's see what that gives us. 2000 times 1.1 to the power of seven. 3,897.43. Okay. Shall we round this to three significant figures? No. Because we're talking about little b's here. It's better to have the exact number. And we've done it. Question 4a. They give us this after they've given us this number over here okay don't let the six centimeters throw you off because the length of a side of a polygon does not influence the size of the angle all we need to remember is the formula for the interior angles of any polygon and that is the number of sides minus 2 times 180 if you ever forget this formula, remember a square. A square has four sides, but when we cut it in half, it forms two triangles. Each triangle is 180 degrees. So we take the number of sides, we subtract two, that gives us the number of triangles that fit inside, and that's times 180. That is the formula we need to remember. So what is 12 minus 2 is 10, times 180 is 1,800. Meaning, all the angles in this 12-sided shape, if we add them together, they will equal to 1,800. Okay. This shape is regular. It means every angle is the same side. So to find the size of one, of those angles, we just divide it by how many angles there is, and there's 12 of them. And that gives us 150. And there we go, we've got our mark. Right, question 4b. So, it tells us that we need to work out the radius of the circle. this moment we only have one thing we've got that six centimeters there okay we need more information can we calculate any of the angles inside the shape um, yes we can there is more than one way to do this okay now remember that each angle is 150 degrees. If we're going to be dividing each slice like this, it means we need to half each angle, giving us each angle here at the base of this triangle is 75. 75 plus 75 is 150. 
if we subtract that from 180 that will give us this angle over here of course you can also do 360 divided by 12 get this angle and then use this as an isosceles triangle to work out the 275 degree angles that's another way what do we have now we've got a triangle it's not a right angle triangle but we can make it into a right angle triangle we can use Sokatua if we cut that triangle in half like this we can use Sokatua or if we don't cut in half we leave it as it is for any other triangles, it's not a right angle, we use either the sine or the cosine rule. And in this case, because we have an angle and the opposite side, like this, means we can use that angle to work out the side over there. And for that, we use the sine rule. So again, there's two ways of calculating this. All right, both ways is shown in the mark scheme. Which one are we going to do? Mini, 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 mo. All right, I think I'm going to use the sine rule. Okay, so side OB or OA, let's do OB, that's what I want to work out, BO or OB, we write for the sine rule, we write it over the opposite angle, which is 75, then we got the side AB, which is 6 centimeters, and we write that over its opposite side, which is 30, now for calculating OB, we just need to multiply that on the other side. So it's 6 times 75 over 30. Now we put that into the calculator. Be careful with the brackets. It could give you syntax error if you leave one out. And there we go. It tells us OB, which is the radius, is 11.591, etc. Okay. And then it says show that it's 11.6. Great. So when we round it, we get 11.6. It's important to write down the unrounded answer so that you show it rounds to 11.6 of course and you're working out also counts for marks sweet question 4b part 2a the circumference of the circle remember the formula for circumference of a circle is pi d or if you're using the radius, 2 pi r. Please, not pi r squared, but that's the area. So, that's straightforward. We know it's 2 pi. They've just given us the radius, even if we got the previous question wrong. They told us it is Gives us a sweet 70.2.884, etc. Okay, rounded to three significant figures 
question 4b part 2b okay the perimeter of the shaded minor segment formed by the chord ab this is a confusing amount of words okay but they did shade it for us there okay they did shade so what we're talking about here is the perimeter i'm gonna to have to zoom in a little bit i'm zooming a lot okay because they don't make it easy of this part so we got the six centimeters going across and then we got the arc there now if you remember we determined earlier that this angle here is 30 degrees so we can use the formula for the arc length with combined with the radius to work out the length of that arc ab but there is a quicker way we've just worked out the circumference of the circle what was that 72.9 and that since this is a 12-sided shape this arc is exactly 1 12th of the circumference so using the formula for the arc of a circle is fine but it's quicker to just go 72.9 divided by 12. okay see i've got a more accurate answer still there so using that we get the side length there as 6.0737 etc okay now remember that's only the length of the arc the top part there we still have that six centimeter the length of the cord so we need to add that as well to get the total perimeter which is the total outside so I just add it to that gives us 12.073 etc round it to one to three significant figures sorry which is there 12.1 question 4c let's picture what is going on here okay we've got the 12-sided shape which i'm going to try to draw now but it's going to come out ugly okay 12-sided shape Imagine that's a 12-sided shape, and now it's damn ugly. Right, now if we can find the area in centimeter square of this shape that has then been made into a, a prism to get the volume in centimeter cubed, we need to multiply it by the length, which is 2. First thing we're going to do is find the area, the area of this thing. Okay, now as we can see, remember this was 75 and this was 75. We can find the area of this triangle, then multiply it by 12, because there will be 12 of them inside the shape. We'll have the area of the polygon. Now remember, there are four different formulas for the area of a triangle. There is half base times height, meaning if we can work out the perpendicular height of the triangle, that line there, we have, we can use that formula. We can do that by using Sokatua, it's a right angle triangle. But I believe there's a quicker way. There's another formula for the area of a triangle, and that's half A, B, C, and C. Okay. Which means all we need is the length of two sides and one angle, and we have that in many forms. Okay. 
if we make this C, we use this angle, and then we can make this A and B the two sides that next to it. Okay. C being the angle included between A and B. We can also use 30 and 11.6, 11.6. There's many ways of doing this. But that's what I'm going to do. So what we're going to do is half A, B, the two sides, 6 and 11.6. Sin C, which is 75. The angle included between those two sides. Let's do it in the right place, though, down here, because this is where the examiner will look for the answer. So, area of a triangle is half A, B, sin C. A and B being two sides of that triangle. Or was it 11.6? Two sides of the triangle and sin and then the angle between those two sides. So let's do that. What a massive answer. So one triangle is 33.614 etc that's one triangle now the area of the polygon would be that answer times 12 because remember there's 12 triangles that fits into 12 sided polygon so I'm leaving that answer there I just times it by 12 there we go 403.37 Do note I'm not rounding anything which is not my final answer So good, we now got the area of the front face of the prism All we need to do now is multiply it by the length which they've given us 2 centimeters So that will be 403.37 times 2 I just take that answer I have, very accurate, times it by 2. Round it to three significant figures, 806. You genius, you've done it. Question 5. This is how much it takes people to travel to work. Here we got three lucky people. It only takes them somewhere between zero and five minutes to travel to work. They must basically be living in the same building. Then there is the ones who's commuting from further away. There's 24 of them, that's a lot. It takes them between 35 and 60 minutes. Okay. Now we want the class interval containing the median time. Remember, median meaning the middle. How do we find the middle of 80 people? Well, we take those 80 people, add 1, this is important, and then divide it by 2, which will give us 81 divided by 2 is 40.5. Okay. That means the middle is between the 40th and the 41st person. So it's not the 40th person, it's between those two. So over here, the people has kind of already been arranged from the ones who take the least amount of time to the ones who take the most amount of time to get to work. Now we need to find the 40th and the 41st person. So after the first interval, we've got the first three people. Imagine we're lining them up. Then we put the next seven people who took between five and 10. Now we have 10 people in this line. Then we line up the next 18 people. That will be 28 people standing in the line. And then we add to that line the next 28, that will be 56 people. So now we've surpassed the 40th and the 41st person. They will both be in this interval, and that's what we want, the interval that contains the middle. So that will be between 20 and 35 minutes. It takes the middle person. Question 5a part 2. 
Next, we need to work out the mean. Remember, mean is we take, add up everything and divide them by how many is. So what is everything? Everything is all the times everybody took to get to work. Okay. So these three people took somewhere between zero and five minutes to get to work. We don't know exactly how long it took them. So we're just going to take the average, what we assume, which is halfway between those two times. So we're going to assume it took them around about two and a half minutes to get to work. It is not exact. That is why we are calculating an estimate. So those three people taking two and a half minutes to work, that's a total time of seven and a half minutes. And we're going to continue this pattern. We're going to take the next seven people. And we're going to assume that roughly it took them seven and a half minutes on average to get to work. And thus we continue. If you're unsure about what the midpoint is, you can add the two end values and then divide it by two. And that will give you the midpoint, which is the estimate of the time. Right, so we will calculate that. We'll have all the times, all the people traveling added together. That will be a lot of times. Then calculating the mean, we divide it by how many there is. For that, we can add up the frequency to see how many people has traveled, or you can just read the question carefully. They've told that there are 80 people. So that's what we put into our calculator. Carefully, make sure we don't press any buttons wrong. And 28 is my answer. Very important now to check. Where is 28 in that table? 28 minutes would be in this group here, which is also where our median was. So that's a good indication that our answer is probably right. But to make double sure, I would do the same calculation at least twice. All right. And then you've got it. Question 5B part 1. So of those 80 people in this table, probably find the probably that one person took longer than 10 minutes to travel to work. Okay, so let's just declutter. Let's see who took longer than 10 minutes. These people from here, everybody more than 10. So these 18 people, these 28 and these 24. They all took longer. So what we need to do is we need to add those together. And write it as a fraction out of 80. Okay. Again, don't waste your time with this. Just put it into your calculator. Nothing fancy. And your calculator will give you the answer as a fraction in the simplest form as they requested. Nice and fast, two easy marks. Then two people are chosen random from those taking 20 minutes or less. So we need to check now again. So they're not picking from 80 people now, they're picking from these 20 minutes or less. So they're picking one of these 28 people. Yeah, that is 28. 3 plus 7 plus so it's 28 people they're picking from. Okay. Calculate. Okay, of course there's two people they're picking. Calculate probably that one of these people took five minutes or less. Let's see. How many took five minutes or less? It's these three. Okay. The probability of picking somebody that took five minutes or less is three out of twenty-eight. And the other took more than five minutes. Now remember, so we're picking the second person. When we pick the second person, we're not going to pick the same person again. So there's only 27 left to pick from. And we're picking them five or more. So now again, we're looking at these people. Seven plus 18 is 25. 
So those are the two probabilities. What do we do now? Do we add or multiply? Remember, this and that has to happen. That means we're doing the AND rule and probability is multiply. So we multiply them together. Which of course will give us 75 over 756. But be careful with this one because we've only calculated one possible outcome. We can pick them the other way around. We can possibly pick first the 25 that took longer than 5, 25 minutes. And when we pick one of those 25, the probability is out of 28 because all the people are still there. Okay. Then we might pick one of the three that took less and then there's 27 less. Okay. In the end, this is going to give us the same probability. But it's another possible outcome. Both of these things are not going to happen. Either this... Or this is going to happen, and when we do the OR rule, we add. Or we can just multiply it by 2. Either way, we add those two together. That will give us 150 out of 756. Okay, if you want to simplify it, you can type it into your calculator, and your calculator will do it for you. But in this case, it tells us, doesn't tell us to write it as a fraction in its simplest form. So whichever way you want to write it, they'll give you the mark. So give you a mark for that, because it's correct. And they didn't tell us to simplify it. You can write it as a decimal or a percentage. Doesn't matter. Okay, of course, you get a mark for that calculation. You get a mark for doubling it. Question C, part 1, cumulative frequency. So this is the running total. They've already done a lot of the work for us. So there's three people who took less than five minutes. Then they added to that the next seven that took between five and ten minutes. Okay, so we go to the table here. They took first the three people. And the next point uh, interval, they took the three and the seven. And then for the next interval, everybody less than 20 minutes, we have to add them all together. And that will be 28. Everybody less than 20 minutes. Next, I want to know how many people took less than 35 minutes. So to that, we need to add the 28, which of course is 56. We know it's correct because when we add to that 56, another 24, Everybody less than an hour, it adds up to 80. Next step would be to draw the cumulative frequency diagram. Okay, remember now, we are using the upper value of the classes to plot this exactly as it is there. Okay, so use a pencil, take your time. First of all, after five minutes, we had three. Look carefully at the scale. There are five squares, so each one square has two values, meaning three is in the middle there. Then 10 and 10. Draw this diagram freehand, not with a ruler. Make sure all the points are plotted correctly. So take your time. Use a pencil. Question 5C part 3. The 80th percentile. Percentile, of course, means percentage. So the 80th percent, which is 0 0.8 so we need to work out 80 percent of the total 80 percent of 80 so for this we're going to do 80 times 0 0.8 which of course 
is 64. Sixty-four people in this case traveling, people traveling. So the eightieth percentile would be at sixty-four. Let me use a different color. Sixty-four. That is where eighty percent of the people lie at sixty-four. So now we need to use our graph, and it's very important that you show this because if the examiner sees that you've drawn these lines. They know you know what you're doing, and there's no guesswork involved because of this question, they don't have an exact value. The mark scheme only says whatever follows through from your value. Okay, so that would be 40 minutes follow through. Question 5C, part 4. How many people took longer than 45 minutes to travel to work? Let's see, where is 45 minutes? I'm going to use a different color again. 45 minutes is right here. So how many people? Again, we use our graph. Go up. And we go across. So, I get 70 people. Okay. What are we looking at 70? Those that took longer than 45 minutes. So, who took longer? These 10 people took longer than 45 minutes. All right. So, we got 10 people. And they're asking for a percentage. So, we write it out of the total. 10 out of 80 took longer than 45 minutes times 100 because it's a percentage. So let's do that. And there we go, 12.5%. Again, the mark scheme doesn't give the value here. They just want you to see all the working out. So what an examiner would look for to give you marks, you'll see, if did you draw these lines and use your graph? to find the values. Did you do the right calculation? And then I'll give you the answer there. Question six, some algebra. Let's have a look. All right, simplify that straightforward. We're collecting like terms. A minus three A. So that's like one minus three is minus two A. And then minus two B plus seven B or seven B minus two B is easier. So that's plus five B. And that's the correct answer. If you want to make it look pretty, you can put the positive number first and then the negative, but you don't have to. Okay, minus 2a plus 5b will get you full marks. Next one, expanding brackets. We all know how to do that. 4 times x is 4x. 4 times minus 5 is minus 20. The next one is where the mistakes usually call in. Imagine there's a one there. So minus one times three is minus three. And this is the big one. Minus one times minus two X, two negatives makes a positive. And one times two X is two X. Okay, if there is a mistake, it's going to be there. Now again, it's collecting like terms. Two X, four X plus two X, six X, minus 20 minus three, Minus 23, don't go minus 17, okay? We're at minus 20 on the number line. We go down another minus 3, and we've got it. Question 6C, algebraic fractions. Let's remind ourselves how we do regular fractions. All right, let's imagine we got two fractions that, well, in this case, we're subtracting, okay? And I'm just going to be giving a negative answer, by the way. First thing we always do is get this common denominator. One way of doing that is just multiplying uh, the 3 and the 4 together. So that will give us 12, common, lowest common uh, multiple there we have. Okay, 
Then we need to multiply this 2 by 4 because we multiply 3. Quick way is just multiply across 2 times 4 is 8. And then we need to multiply that 3 by 3 to get the chrome diffractor. And we get is a minus in the middle. Okay, and then we can subtract it. Okay, I call it the smiley face method because it's smiley. I crossed that. We've got it. So we do the same here with this question. We're going to multiply the two denominators together to get the common multiple. And remember, we need to multiply everything with everything. So we're going to use brackets like that. Then we multiply across. 3 times 2x is 6x. Remember, there's a minus in the middle. And then all of this, x minus 5 times 7. So again, we use the brackets. Okay. Now we can't cancel the x minus 5 because there's a minus there. So what we're going to do next is expand those brackets. So at the top, minus 7 times x minus 7x. Minus 7 times 5. Two negatives makes a positive. So it's positive 35 because we're multiplying. We can, if we want, expand the brackets below the line. I usually don't. Okay, first of all, because it's not necessary. Secondly, sometimes you're able to cancel stuff out. And it's better if it's in factorized form than expanded form. Okay, so the next step here would be to collect the like terms at the top. 7x, 6x minus 7x is minus 1x. And the 35 is still there. Okay, but it doesn't look like we'll be able to cancel anything. So that is our final answer. Of course, the mathematicians like to put the positive numbers first and then the negative ones. Again, you don't have to do that to get full marks. Okay, to go minus x plus 35 will get you your marks. Question 6d. Now we're solving. Okay, first thing. I would do here is get rid of the fraction. So I multiply the 3 on the other side. It looks like this. 13 minus 4x and 3 is being multiplied by everything, not just the 6. Everything is multiplied by 3. Expanding that bracket. 3 times 6 is 18. 3 times minus x is minus 3x. Excellent. Next would be to get all the x's on one side and everything else on the other side. What I prefer to do is get x is positive. So I'm going to leave the minus 3x where it is and then add 4x to both sides. So add the 4x there. And I'm going to leave that 13 where it is and then subtract 18 from both sides or subtract the 18 there. Okay, look carefully at your signs. Yeah. 13 minus 18, of course, is a negative 5. A minus 3x plus 4x gives me a positive x, or 1x, or that, or yeah, we've got the answer. x equals minus 5. Right. And that's what the mask scheme says. But you got time. Why not check your answer? by substituting the minus 5 into these equations and see if you get the same answer. 13 minus 4 times minus 5 over 3 equals 6 minus minus 5. Of course, 2 minuses makes a plus. That gives us 11. So over there, the top of the line, and we want to be quick with this. We don't want to waste time. We hammer into our calculator and we get 11. And you ask yourself, is 11 equal to 11? Brilliant. You got it right. Question 6e. Make x the subject. You see that? That they want, they want the x all by its loan on the left-hand side of the equal sign. Now, first thing, there's two damn x's. We want one. Okay, forget about that for now. First thing we do is get rid of any fractions, meaning we multiply the x there. So now we've got x, y equals 5 minus 2x. Now what? Well, there's brackets. We know how to expand brackets. Let's do it. So we've got x, y equals 5 times p is 5p. 5 times minus 2 is minus 10x. OK, 
Okay. Remember, we want all the x's on the same side. So let's do that. Let's move all the terms with an x on the same side. So I'm going to leave the x, y on the left. And we're going to move the minus 10x to the other side. So it becomes plus 10x. Now is the opportunity to make those two x's 1x. And we do this by factorizing. Take that x, factorize it out. And inside the bracket, we write what is left, y plus 10. Okay, so when we expand that bracket, x times y is x, y, x times 10 is 10x. We're still in the same position. We've got one last step left to do. x multiply that whole bracket, so we can now divide it on the other side. That will give us x equals 5b over y plus 10. Excellent. That is the correct answer. Okay, no simplifying to be done. There's a plus below the line. You've done it. Question seven, a triangle. Remember this, when we have a right angle triangle, we can use Pythagoras if we're only working with the sides. Or if there's any angles involved, we use Sokatua. For any other triangle that's not a right angle tri triangle, we either use the sine or the cosine rule. So, in this one, question seven, they ask us to calculate BC. It's not a right angle triangle, so we know we're going to use the sine or the cosine rule. For the sine rule, this is what I always check first, we need a side and the opposite angle. Meaning, if we had this angle and that side, it means we can use the sine rule, but we don't. Okay, same there. If we had this angle, or if we could work it out, because we have the opposite side, that means we can use the sine rule. Okay, but we don't. So that means we're going to go for the cosine rule. All right. That is all of it. Where we need to find a side, or we've got three sides and angle, cosine rule. So let's write it down. A squared equals B squared plus C squared. Starts off with Pythagoras and then the rest. Okay. So, what is A, what is B, what is C? Now, we're very lucky here because they've labeled the triangle for us in the correct way. They don't always do it. Then you can relabel the triangle with your own A, B, and C. But they've done it for us. There's A. There's B and there's C, lowercase, and the angles is correct as well. All right, so let's start doing this. A is B, C. Now, to save time, I'm already going to sort out that square, which means we square root the other side. B is 55, C is 82. By the way, if you swap these two numbers around, it doesn't matter. And then, of course, and the angle. Now we can put that into a calculator straight away. Make sure that your square root, that line at the top, covers everything you're doing. And we've got the answer BC equals 86.987 rounded to three significant figures of course what comes after 69 or 6.9 80 or 87.0 that point zero is just there to show it's three significant figures if you leave it out you'll still get full marks
Question 7b, calculate angle ACB. Angle ACB. Here we go. That is what we want to know. So let's do our test. Do we have an angle and the opposite side? The answer is yes. We've just calculated that. You see? And when we have that, an angle and the opposite side, we know we can go for the sine rule. So for the sine rule, I always start off with what I want to know, and that's the angle ACB. Okay, angle ACB. Now, angles comes with the trig ratio, so that is, we put that sin ACB, the angle, over the opposite side, which is 82. So we put this in at the top, so we need another angle, and we're taking that 76, because we have the opposite side, 87. So it's sin 76 over 87. Having the unknown, thing you want to calculate at the top, makes rearranging this equation easier, and our calculation easier. So let's rearrange it first. We're going to get rid of this 82, we multiply it over there. Then this sin, so a final calculation will be the inverse of sin and then everything that was already there. Okay, it's always better to do everything all at once. So let's do that. We start with shift, inverse of sin, fraction, 82 times sin, 76 close bracket, 87, close bracket, equal. So what did I get? 66.139, etc. Rounded to three significant figures, 66.1. Sweet, you're a genius. Question 7C. A gate G lies on AB at the shortest distance from C. So the shortest distance from C. What does that look like? Let's get some colors here. Okay. Shortest distance from C is going to be a perpendicular line forming a 90 degree angle. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> So this is a 90 degree angle. What do they want to know? Or remember, there was G, it was a gate. G. Find, calculate a G. So what we're looking for now is this length here. Remember what I said before, if we've got a right angle, we use Pythagoras and Sokatua. And over here, we've got a side and an angle so as angles evolved we're gonna use soccer to work. let's label our triangle okay opposite the 90 degree angle the 55 that is the hypotenuse and the side here we want to know a g is right next to the angle so that's the adjacent we're looking at here using the cos ratio because we've got the adjacent and the hypotenuse so let's write that down so we start with cos, the angle, then A is first, we put the adjacent first, which is the side AG, over the hypotenuse, and this one we got 55 meters. So to find AG, we just need to multiply the 55 there. So it's 55 times cos 76 will give us AG. And that gives us 13.305, etc. Three significant figures, 13.3.
Question 7D. This is the big one, the five mark question. Right, let's start slowly. So they're talking about a new triangle called PQR. So let's draw that triangle PQR. Where PQ is 90 and QR is 60. And they want to know two values for that angle PQR. Okay, we'll get to the two values later. So let's start with that first sentence. It's the same as the area of triangle ABC. So let's go back to triangle ABC and we need to work out the area there. Now remember, there are two ways to work out the area of a triangle. There's the old half times base times perpendicular height. Okay, now we can use that. We can use Sokatua to work out the perpendicular height of that line AC we used in the previous question. Or there's the other method, half A, B, C, and C. Now I'm going to use the second method because for me it's just shorter, it can be quicker, less working out. Okay, so to help me as well, I'm going to change, just change this formula. I'm going to do C, the angle. I'm going to make that the angle they've given us at the beginning, just in case I've made any mistakes when I calculated this 87 or 66.1. Okay, exam, you won't know if it's right. And then A and B is the two sides that encloses that angle in any order. So A could be 82 or A could be 55 and B the other way around. So that's what we need to do. And we're going to write this down in the right place so the examiner can see where it is. He doesn't have to go hunt for it. Okay, so what we're doing, we're working out the area of triangle ABC. which is half those two sides, which was 82 and 55, and the enclosed angle between those two sides, 76. So let's work that out. Half 82, 55, 76. And there we go, 2,188.01, etc. Okay, don't round it yet. I always round in the end. Keep it there on your calculator screen. So now we can do the area of triangle PQR. We know what it is. It's 2, 1, it's the same. 2, 1, 8, 8.01, etc. And we use the same formula, half, A, B, and C. So for this one, we're going to make angle Q the C of the formula, and A and B is the other two sides in any order, so the 90 and the 60. And I'm going to call this PQR because that's what we're working on. Right. So now to solve this, first thing I'm going to do, all of this which is being multiplied with sin PQR, we're going to divide it over there. So it's going to look like this. Sweet, let's do that. So you see I've still got that on my calculator. All I need is divide it by, put this in a bracket to make sure no mistakes creeps in, half of 90 times 60, close brackets. That will give us 0 0.8103, etc. Now to get the actual angle, we need to move the sin, do the inverse of sin. So I'm just going to move over here. That will give me the inverse of sin, that angle. Let's have a look. 
shift send and then I can insert my last answer so I don't lose any accuracy and there we go we got one of the angles which is 54.132 very accurate answer here and we're going to round this not to three significant figures but to one decimal place because it's an angle which in this case happens to be three significant figures as well mark now we got one of the answers but we're going for full marks we need to find the other possible angle okay basically this could be an acute triangle or it could be an what's that obtuse triangle where these sides can still be 90 and 60 but the third side will be smaller or bigger depending on the angle so we found this angle now we want to find that one there let's remind ourselves what a sin graph looks like since we've been using sin right so remember now we had 0 0.81 0 0.81 when we did put the inverse of sin okay and that when we put that in we got the answer 54 so if we go across from there and we go down that's what we actually did we got the answer 54 okay but if we go across more from 0 0.81 we meet the sin graph again we go down and that's where the second answer lie now the wonderful thing of having a symmetrical sin graph is if this distance here from zero to there is 54 it means this distance from 180 down that way is also 54 point whatever whatever so yes to find the other angle we simply need to subtract our angle from 180 so let's do that we're now going to do 180 do 180 minus the angle we had to get the new one so on the calculated 180 minus our previous answer which is on there that gives us 125.8 six seven round it once again very important not three significant figures it's an angle we round it to one decimal place one decimal place which in this case is four significant figures you really don't want to lose a mark there for wrong rounding if you're unsure Write the full answer. You do get marks for the full answer, okay? But you lose marks for wrong rounding. Well done, you genius. Well done. Question 8A part 1. They give us the coordinates of three points and they tell us first find the coordinates of the midpoint of line AB. Let's have a look what these points look like. A, B, and C. And first of all, they tell us find the midpoint of line AB. So let's draw that. Let's draw line AB. And where is the middle of that line? Well, somewhere around here, isn't it? Doesn't it look like the middle there? Like minus a half one. Okay. How are we going to find the midpoint of that line? Well, if you have a sketch like this, I know you won't have any exam, but if you do, okay, we make this into a right angle triangle. Best thing to do would be determine the length of this side, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So half of that is 6, so we go 6 squares down, so it's 6 squares down from 7, that will give me 1 for the y value, and down here, this is 3 squares wide, so half of that is 1.5, go 1.5, 1 
from 1, and that gives us minus a half. There we go, we got the answer. Of course, <clears throat> you're not going to have what I have in the exam. So we want to do this with a formula. And the formula for the midpoint of a line, the coordinates of the midpoint is adding the two x values together and then halving it. That's how we found the horizontal length and adding the two y values together and then halving that. That's how we got one, remember? So what's it going to look like? Let's label this x1 and x2. So we got minus 2 plus 1 divided by 2. That's minus 2 plus 1 is minus 1. That will give us minus a half. And let's label this y1 and y2. So that is 7 plus minus 5. which is the same as 7 minus 5, which is 2. 2 divided by 2 is 1. As I said, that is the midpoint. Then it says, find AC with a little arrow at the top. And that little arrow means vector, because only vectors has directions going from A to C. And as you can see, where we need to write the answer, they put the column vector brackets for us. So remember, with column vectors, the number at the top tells us to go left or right, the number at the bottom, how much up and down. To the right, of course, is positive, to the left, negative, up is positive, down is negative. Right, so what we have looked like in the sketch, let's have a look. So this time, we are going from A to C, from A to C in that direction. So first of all, Going to the right is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 7 to the right, that's a positive 7. And we got 1, 2, 3 down, that's a negative 3. Okay. So that's our answer. 7 to the right and 3 down. How are we going to find this without the sketch? You just need to think carefully. All right. So the horizontal axis, we're going from minus 2 to 5. What's the space? What's the difference? What's the stretch there? Okay, that is 7. And going then down from 7 to 4 is minus 3. Hope that helps. Okay, there's no marks here for working out. It's just one mark for the 7, one mark for the minus 3. Question 8a part 3. Again, similar to the question above, we got the AC with the arrow, just with the two lines. All right, that means the magnitude. It also means it's positive. It just doesn't have any negative values. How long is the line? All right, so going back at our sketch here, we can make out of this a right angled triangle. See that? So now, if we want to know the length of this line, what do we do? We do Pythagoras. Okay, Pythagoras, of course, would be the two sides, 7 and minus 3 squared. And if you square that minus 3, put it in brackets, or just square 3, because the answer is positive anyway. And that will get us the hypotenuse, which is the magnitude of the vector AC. Okay, without the sketch, there is a formula. Okay, finding the magnitude of the vector AC formula is as follows. We're doing Pythagoras. Okay, and again, we need to find the distance between the two coordinates. So this will be 
x2 minus x1, subtracting the two coordinates from each other. That will give us the distance of 7. Let's see now if we get that. And then we do the same to find the well, y2. Don't swap them around y1, the distance, the vertical distance between the two y values. So what does it look like? Well, here we go. What is the coordinates we have? a was minus 2, 7. Let me just write that down. So if a is minus 2, 7. And c, the other coordinate point, is 5, 4. This being x1 and this being x2, we do 5 minus minus 2 squared. See? Gives us that 7, which we already have. So you don't maybe have to do as much effort as I have. Okay. Plus y, this is y1, this is y2. So it will be 4 minus 7 squared. There we go, which gave us that minus 3. So, of course, there we go. 7 squared plus minus 3 squared. Again, use those, but without the brackets, you're going to square it, and you're going to have a minus, you're going to get the wrong answer. So, very important to use those brackets. So, it's squared, 7 squared, plus, or you can just do 3 squares because it becomes positive anyway. And you get this answer. Rounded to three significant figures, 7.62. Well done. Question 8a part 4. So we want the equation of the line AB. Again, let's just write down the coordinates of A and B. So we don't have to jump around all the time. Now, with this sketch, what does it look like? The equation of line AB. First of all, remember, we got y equals mx plus c. c being the y-intercept, and you can see there, the line AB crosses the y-axis at minus 1. So we know that's going to be minus 1. m being the gradient, and there we can say the Vertical distance is 12, the horizontal distance is 3, so we can do 12 over 3, which is 4. Uh, be careful, it's going down, so it's negative, so one of these has to be negative. And there we go, minus 4x minus 1. That is the equation. How do you do this without a sketch? Okay, this is what we need to do now. Okay, so... First thing I will do is we'll calculate the gradient M. Now remember the gradient M is the change in Y over the change in X. So it's Y2 minus Y1. That will give you that vertical distance. And X2 minus X1. That will give you the horizontal distance. And then we have the gradient. So again, label everything here. X1 x2, y1, y2, so y2 being minus 5, minus y1 is 7, over x2 being 1, x1 being minus 2, so that would be minus, minus 2. Very important to get the signs right, okay, because we're subtracting a negative number, it's two minuses. So minus 5 over minus 7 gives us minus 12. 2 minus is a plus. That gives us 3. And that gives us minus 4. Brilliant, as we've seen before. So now we got the equation y equals, we've got the gradient, is minus 4x plus c. Now to find the y-intercept, we know it's minus 1. We saw before, but how to do it without this graph? Well, we've got x and y values. We've got two there. we got there and there. So any one of these we need to substitute into our equation. I'm going to use the first one. So I'm going to make y is 7 and x is minus 2. 
right minus four times minus two of course is a positive eight and then we subtract the eight that gives us minus one brilliant remember that's what we saw on the graph before so now I can take my equation and just put the C value in. Final answer, gradient is minus 4 and crosses the y-axis at minus 1. Bam, done it. Question 8a, part 5. Now we're getting heating things up. It says find the equation of the line perpendicular 90 degrees to AB that passes through C. So let's go back on our sketch. What does this look like? What does this look like? Right, so there I've got line AB. Uh, we now need to find the line that is perpendicular to that line going through C. So a line going through C at a 90 degree angle. I'm just going to have to eye this. Okay, something, something like this. Something like that. Okay. Not sure exactly, but there we go. Okay. So what do we know? Again, equation we need to write. So that's going to be have to be in the form of y equals mx plus c. What do we know? Now, if you remember from before that we worked out the gradient of the line AB. It was minus 12 over 3, which gave us minus 4. So the gradient of that line was minus 4. Gradient of the perpendicular line. First thing we want to notice, as AB was negative, perpendicular is now positive. So we're going to change the sign. The minus has become positive. We don't have to put the plus, just remember it's positive. Okay. And then we kind of swap as well. Let's just use a different color, right? Now we got a triangle. If we do a triangle over there, what's happened here? Look carefully. My vertical distance now has become three, where before the horizontal was three, and the horizontal now is 12, where before the vertical was 12. So we've swapped it around, meaning where my gradient before was minus 4 or minus 4 over 1. Now it's swapped around. Minus 12 over 3 becomes 3 over 12. So it becomes now 1 quarter. So this is what we need to remember about perpendicular lines. The direction changes. So minus becomes a positive or a positive and a minus, And we invert the gradient. So 4 becomes 1 over 4. Or a third will become three. It swaps. So that maybe is the first thing we can write down when we answer that question. Okay, and there's not much you can show here in terms of working out. You can show that AB had a gradient of minus four or minus four over one. So the new line will have a gradient of swap it around. 1 over 4, and if you want, you can put the positive. But leaving out the negative implies it's positive. That means we can now write our equation as y equals a quarter x plus c. What is plus c? Let's go back. Where does this line cross the y-axis? Now, it looks there like it could be 1, 2, 2 and a half maybe less two and a third so something like that i can't see exactly but there's of course a way to find it out without the sketch just using algebra okay so it goes through the point c and we know the coordinates of point c is they told us that at the beginning five four now that 5 and that 4, that's an x and a y value, which is on the line, which we can substitute into this equation. So if y is 4, then 5 is a quarter, sorry, x is a quarter of 5 plus c. Multiply them together. 5 times a quarter gives us 5 quarters. 
or one and a quarter, doesn't matter because now we're going to subtract it. So four minus five quarters. Okay, don't break your head. I mean, you can work it out. It's three and three quarters, or is it? Or just use your calculator. Two and three quarters. Okay, that's why it's better using the calculator. So that gives us C equals two and three quarters. Okay, I see on the mark scheme, they prefer to keep it as an improper fraction. I mean, or you can put 2.75. Either way, we now have the equation of the perpendicular line. The gradient is one quarter and the y-intercept, whichever way you prefer to write this. Two and three quarters, 11 over four, 2.75, they're all correct. And once again, you've done it. Right, question 8b. I think they've tried to throw in a few booby traps here, but we can handle it. All right, first of all, they tell us there are two graphs. One has got an x square in it, so we know it's quadratic. Means we got, and the other one is a straight line. Means they cross in two points. Let me show you what that actually looks like. So there we got the graph of y equals 2x squared plus 6x minus 13. As you can see, it's quadratic. And then y plus 5x equals 8. There it is. And as you can see, it crosses in two places. First spot is over here. Okay. There we go. Minus 1.5 and a half, roughly. Okay. That will be the one answer. And then way up over there, it crosses again. Okay. Looks like minus 7 and 43. Right. Those are the answers. Got the answers. I just showed it to you. But how to find these answers without this wonderful decimals graphing? So let's go. We go back here. So the first thing to remember is where the, cross, the graphs cross, they are equal. They got the same coordinates in those two points. So we need to somehow write these two equations equal to each other. Okay. Now, the best thing to do is rearranging here. You see y plus 5x. We can rearrange it to y equals 8 minus 5x. Now, because all of this is equal to y, and over here, the quadratic graph, all of that is equal to y, it means they're equal to each other. So we can write it now, yeah? So 2x squared plus 6x minus 13 equals 8 minus 5x it's y let's rearrange it we got 2x squared plus 6x that minus 5x we're gonna add it and the 8 we're gonna subtract it so it's minus 13 minus 8 equals 0 which gives us 2x squared plus 11x minus 21 equals 0. Okay. Now, we know we need to factorize. This might be difficult to factorize. If you like factorizing, you're good at it, you can do it. Remember, when we looked at the answer, they were decimal answers, which will make this hard, but not impossible. But in this case, I think the quickest would be to use the quadratic formula. Let's remind ourselves of what that is. That is x equals minus b plus minus square root b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Okay, what is a? What is b? What is c? Here we go. a is 2, b is 11 and C being negative 21. So let's substitute negative 21, negative 21. Let's substitute those values into the equation. So B is 11. Which gives us 11 squared minus four A is two. C negative 21. 
very important and 2 over 2 right now to put this into the calculator so calculator and let's go for it so start putting in a fraction negative 11 I'm going to do plus first square root 11 square minus 4 2 negative 21 close bracket over 2 times 2 one. There we go. Does that look familiar? 3 over 2, 1.5. Remember, when we saw it before, that was one of the points. Okay, whichever way you like to write it. 3 over 2. Okay, now finding the other answer, we can just use the arrows to go back. We don't have to enter everything again. And change that plus for a minus. And bam, minus 7. As before. Brilliant. We have made good progress. We got 3 over 2 and minus 7. Now our next step will be finding the y-intercept. Okay, and for that we can use any of the original equations. So any one of these equations at the top. Yeah, y plus 5x plus 8, y2x plus 6x minus 13. Straight line one on the left, of course, will be easier, less work. So, in fact, once we rearrange it, I mean, that was maybe the best because that will give us y straight away. So, I'm going to use that one, y equals 8 minus 5x. So, I'm using y equals 8 minus 5x. Put in first the first x value, so that's minus 5 times 1.5 or 3 over 2. Let's hammer that in. 8 minus 5 times 1.5, 1 1.5, bam. Remember, that was the one answer. We had that one. And for the second value, y equals 8 minus 5 minus 7. Minus 5 minus 7, two negatives makes a plus, that's 35. At the 8 gives us 43 and sweet exactly what we wanted full marks question 9a some more graphs right so now they want us, us to sketch this graph y equals x plus 1 3 minus x and 3 plus x Okay, indicating where they cross the axes. Now, one thing to remember is when that line crosses the y-axis, so that means anywhere along this line, okay, what does the x equal to? Zero. So anywhere on the y-axis, x is equal to zero. So that just means, okay, to find the y-intercept, we need to make x zero. So that will look like this. So y equals 0 plus 1, 3 0, 3 plus 0, which will mean we got 1 times 3 times 3, which is 9. So somewhere on this, it crosses the axis at 9 indicated right and now the same is true for the x axis whatever crosses the x axis y equals 0 so we can write y equals 0 so we take that equation so 0 equals x plus 1 3 minus x 3 plus x now if you multiply three numbers together and it gives you zero, then we can separate them all and put them equal to zero. So that will give us x plus one equals zero, which means x is minus one. So it crosses the x axis at minus one. We do three minus x equals zero. Let's move the x to the other side. So that means three equals x or x equals three. So it crosses the x axis at three. And the last one there, 3 plus x, 
equals 0. So that means move to 3, x equals minus 3. So now we got everywhere where it crosses the axis. You take your pencil and you think carefully, right? If I were to multiply out those three brackets, x plus 1, 3x minus x, 3 plus x, I'm going to get an x cubed, which means this is a quadratic graph. What does a quadratic graph look like? Well, like two parabolas, like a wave, yeah? So it means something like this. We're going to start top left, come up, go through 9, come back down. Okay, exactly if it's correct, doesn't matter what's important, is that you indicate 9, minus 3, minus 1, and 3, and you get your 4 marks. Question 9b, part 1, show that that is that, so we need to expand those brackets. So we do this slowly, carefully, paying attention to the signs. So we start with x plus 1 and 3 minus x. But don't lose the other one hanging around at the back. But I think there's a quicker way of doing this. And that is expanding the last two brackets first. Because that's a complete square. So you've got the two same things in the brackets. 3 and x, 3 and x with the signs changing. That means, in this case, we can multiply the 3 with the 3, which gives us 9, and multiply the x with the x, which gives us an x squared, and put the mine in the middle. Okay. Shortcut. If you remember this, you can do this. Okay. Why is it true like that? Well, I'm going to show you the long way, but you can fast forward this bit if you know what I've just done. Okay, I've recognized this. Let's do it the long way. Long way means 3 times 3 is 9. 3 times x is plus 3x. Minus x times 3 is minus 3x. And minus x times plus x is minus x squared. As you can see, the two middle terms cancel each other out. We're left with 9 minus x squared. Okay, this is only valid if we have the same thing in both brackets with the signs being different. Any other circumstance, this will not happen. Okay. So, if you can remember that, you'll save some time in the exam. But we still need to now expand those two brackets. So let's do that. x times 9 is 9x. x times minus x squared is minus x cubed. 1 times 9 is 9. And 1 times minus x is minus x squared. Let's just rearrange it like they want it. They put the 9 first, then the positive 9x, then the negative x squared, then the negative x cubed. Now you've done it. Of course, there's other ways to do it. You can expand the first two brackets, and you'll get up in the end the same answer. But this is the quickest way. Question 9b, part 2. And now they're talking about the turning points. All right, so let's look at that graph. 9 plus 9x minus x squared minus x cubed. There it is. Okay, and as you can see, the turning point is up there and down here. And there's the answer. The x value there is 1.43, and the x value for the turning point below is minus 2.097. Okay. How are we going to find them without the sketch? Well, we need to remember that where the graph turns, if we were to draw a tangent at those points, so that line in red, that's the tangent, touching the graph where it turns, and the tangent up there, these are horizontal lines where the gradient is zero. And how do we find the gradient on any curve? We do that by differentiating. So, where the, turn, the gradient on the curve is zero, that is where the turning point is. First step here, finding gradient, is differentiation. So, for that, we need to start here. Right, start with that 9. There is no x value. Remember, there was an x to the power of zero. 
next to that because anything to the power of zero is one. So yeah, zero times nine is zero. That's zero, so that falls away. For the next term, there's a little one up there. One times nine is nine. And then we subtract 1 from there. That gives us x to the power of 0. Anything to the power of 0 is 1. So 9 times 1 is 9. So the x falls away. Okay. Next term, differentiating. 2 times minus 1 is minus 2. x, subtract 1 from that 2. That gives us to the power of 1. Or nothing, you can leave it out. You know it's there. Then we got the 3. 3 times the minus 1 is minus 3. Subtract 1 from that 3. That gives a square, right? If you're confused by what I've just done, please revise your differentiation methods. Okay, and that is equal to the gradient of the curve at any point. In this case, we're looking at where the gradient is 0. Okay, so that means now we need to solve this equation. So again, it's a quadratic equation. It's going to give us two answers, which we need because there's two turning points. We can try to factorize, but in this case, again, probably quicker, the quadratic formula. So here we go again, second time on this paper, minus b plus minus b squared minus 4ac over to a what is a what is b what is c a is the coefficient in front of the x squared so don't get makes that get that confused so that will be minus three b in front of the x and c the term with no unknowns so let's substitute those into our equation So now we have minus b is minus 2. That gives us two minuses. Very careful with the signs. Again, b is minus 2 squared. Make sure you put that minus inside a bracket and the square outside the bracket. Minus 4a is negative 3. c is 9 over 2 times minus 3. So calculator. And here we go. So fraction negative bracket negative two positive first square root. Use brackets here, very important. Minus four negative three nine over two negative three. And there we go. Remember, I've shown you the answers before, and that's what we wanted. Minus 2.097, etc. Find the other x value. Use your arrows. And change the plus to a minus. And that gives us 1.4305. Okay. They say show all your answers correct to two decimal places. So when we round, it's very important. Minus 2.097, two decimal places is rounded there, but there's a 7, so the 9 becomes a 10. So it looks like this. Okay, and that one, 1.43. Eugenius! Question 8b, part 3. You need to really be able to use your imagination here. It says, the equation equals k has one solution only when k is less than a or when k is more than b. What are the integers? Integers, remember, is whole number. So no fractions, decimals here. Okay, find the maximum value of a and the minimum value of b. Let's see what that looks like, right? So here again, this is the graph we've looked at before. The graph of 
9 plus 9x minus x squared minus x cubed. Now, if we were to draw a line, let's say through there, y equals 5, we will have three solutions there. 1, 2, 3. See that? Okay. It's not what we're going for. If we were to draw a line going the tangent to the turning point, remember before, it goes there. You see that? All right. There we'll have exactly two solutions. So what we're going for here is finding one solution. So if we go above there, we, if we go above that line, let's look, look at that, right? The turning point is 16.9. So if we go just above there, the line y equals 17 would just be above 16.9. There we'll have only one solution. It won't touch. The same as below here. If we got a line going through y equals minus 6, we'll have only one solution because the x value there is minus 5. So those are our two answers. y equals 17 and y equals minus 6. Now, how to find this without a drawing? Okay. And the answer for this is, right, we're looking for the y equals value. Okay, so as you can see, right, we know it's the y equals values because there they've substituted a k for the original equation, which was this one, for a y. So that basically means we need to work out the y values for the turning points because y equals k. So from our previous question, we have the x values. So if we substitute those into our equations here, we'll get the y values, which is the k values, which is the same thing. So let's start with that. All right, so 9 plus 9. First one here, minus 2.1. So minus 2.1 minus minus 2.1 squared minus minus 2.1 cube. Bring back that calculator. And let's put that in. 9 plus 9, negative 2.1. And that gives us, remember I've shown you on the sketch, minus 5.049. That's how we find the y value. Okay, now remember this is the minimum point. So in the exam, I would draw myself a little graph. Okay, or use the graph we have over there. Yeah, that is minus 2.1, and now we know this is minus. 5.049. So the next integer below that one, below minus 5, will give us one result that is minus 6. Okay, so finding the maximum value of A minus 6. The line that goes horizontal through there. that will only cross the graph in one position. And to do that, we need to find the other y value. We do the same. We substitute 1.43 into the equation. So we got 9 plus 9, 1.43 minus 1.43 squared, 1.43. Cube. Here we go. Okay. 
bam, 16.9. So the next integer above that point that will only have one solution will be y equals 17. Okay, or if we go here, remember this is the point 1.43. Sixteen point nine. We need to go above sixteen point nine. The first, the minimum value, can go above that. Seventeen. You genius. Got it. Question ten. We're almost there. Let's keep going. Right. Let's see. They give us all this information that is in the sketch. Right. Read through it carefully. CG is six. AG is 24, but what's not in the sketch is this piece of information. AB equals twice BC. So, let's simplify things. Let's make BCX, which would make AB 2X. Makes sense, yeah? If you double BC, you get X. I mean, you get AB. If you double BC, you get AB, so that's why X is 2X. Right, great. Now, they want to know what is AB. Let's mark it. AB. Now, AB forms part of a triangle here. See that? Flat on the base. If I'm going to flip that up so you can see what I mean. There we go. X to X. Great. Immediately, lights go on. Pythagoras. Okay, but we haven't used it 24 and 6 yet, but of course that forms another Beautiful triangle. Uh, we mark, we mark it like this. You see that? All right, brilliant. And in that nice green triangle, 24 is the hypotenuse. And because we're doing Pythagoras, it doesn't matter what the other one is. So, meaning if you want to find a C, which you want to do. We want to find AC because this is what these two triangles have in common. AC, we have to do, let me write it properly here. So AG is the hypotenuse squared equals the other two sides, CG squared and AC squared added together. Okay, but since we want to know what AC is, we're going to have to subtract from AG squared, subtract CG squared. So in short, to find AC, I need to do the square root of 24 squared minus 6 squared. Let's do that. Okay. Now, to keep things accurate, I'm going to keep my answer in cert form. 6 square root 15 is just it's the most accurate part of my form, my answer. And without uh, rounding anything, I can be 100% accurate. Sweet. Now let's write the Pythagoras rule down for the second triangle, this orange triangle, right? And remember, this is B. So for this one, AC squared will equal BC squared. Just write it correctly, please. BC squared plus AB squared. All right, all the other way around. So let's write that. We know what AC is. We just worked it out. 6 square root 15. We need to square that. BC is X, so that's X squared. And AB is 2X, so that's 2X squared in brackets. This is important. Okay. What is 6 squared root 15 squared? Let's have a look. Is it square root? Beautiful, 540. What is 2X squared? Remember, you're squaring both. You square the 2, which is 4, and you square the X, which is X squared. So now we can add them together. 1x squared plus 4x squared gives us 5x squared. 
divide that 5, so that will be 540 divided by 5. What is that? 108, of course. Don't waste your time. No. That can't be. Yeah, 108. And what's left to do? Find x square root that 108. Yeah, I know it's a positive and a negative answer, but in this case, it doesn't matter. Okay. Because we're just dealing with lengths, so negatives is not relevant. So, is that the correct final answer? No. Look carefully. Okay. I've worked out x. X is BC. So that is 10.4 where AB is double that. So I need to take this answer, let's take the unrounded answer and double it. Ten point three eight. Double that. Now we got the right answer. Twenty point seven eight four which gives us twenty Point eight rounded three significant figures. Question ten B the end. Finally, calculate the angle between AG and the base ABCD. So what they're turning talking about here is AG, we got that there. It's the hypotenuse. Okay, and the base refers to this angle over here. So what we're talking about is here. The angle between AG and AC. So in that triangle, what do we have? We've got two sides. We've got the hypotenuse. And we've got the opposite. And we want to know what an angle is. So we're going to use Sokatua. Using the opposite and the hypotenuse means we're using the same rule. So let's write that down. Then the angle GAC or CAG we need to put the opposite, the O first, so that's 6 over the hypotenuse. We're going to use 6 over 24. Let's rearrange that to find angle CAG, move the sin, that's the inverse of sin. And that's what we put into our calculator. Shift sin, fraction 6 over 24, close bracket, bam. Okay, round it to one decimal place, since it's an angle, which is three significant figures. 14.5 degrees. That was hard work, but it was fun. Like, subscribe, comment, all that stuff. See you again soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>